Polar nights are not something to be taken lightly. In the uppermost latitudes along with the deepest latitudes around the Arctic and Antarctic circles, for around one month a year and even longer in some other areas getting up to six months a year, this night is continuous and unbroken. The day recedes and the area is plunged into darkness leading to a whole host of issues for humans such as depression, alcoholism, increased violence, and just a general feeling of malaise and fatigue as your meat suits are not getting any nutrients from the sun such as vitamin D. However, with all the wildlife and dangerous animals in these regions, one particular predator would would be one that nobody really saw coming and would absolutely 100% benefit from these conditions. Way up in Alaska on the cusp of the end of human habitation where few cities lie further north is a town of Barrow, Alaska. Approaching its own month-long night, the town becomes besieged by bloodthirsty vampires infected with a virus that makes them almost completely invulnerable to all forms of defenses the town had at its disposal. So clearly today we'll be talking about the movie 30 Days of Night as well as what these vampires are and ultimately what was the fate of the town. And since it's Spooky month, what apropos timing! Alright, so you know the drill, up on screen there'll be a timestamp that you can jump to and that'll take you to the point where we actually talk about the virus and see what it has done to the human form, but for everyone else let's get to a summary of the movie because apparently this movie wasn't really that well received, so who knows, you might not have actually seen it. So we open up on the town of Barrow, Alaska, this small town located around the 71st North Latitude Line is quite active as people are beginning to get things together. Every year roughly three to 400 people of the original 530 inhabitants pick up and move further south to Fairbanks or even further south to escape the darkness of the month. Usually going off without a hitch, this time will be different. Just offshore, a large ship is seen to have been stranded or destroyed. There does not appear to be any life left on the boat and instead only one man can be seen rowing from the wreckage. The town continues to prepare for the coming darkness as a stranger from the boat makes his way into town. Once there, he begins to sabotage the town and its ability to communicate. Phones are stolen, which are noticed by the sheriff, and then they are all burned outside. Later, the sled dogs are also taken out to prevent anyone from leaving in any capacity apart from walking and then freezing in the wilderness. As Sheriff Eben Olson investigates these crimes, he begins to become suspicious that there is someone amongst them that doesn't belong. He's told it's really just stacked up to teenagers pulling a prank, but with all the other strange things happening in town, he isn't so sure that's the case. As he continues with his investigation, the sheriff's estranged wife who was planning to leave the town ends up missing her flight out of there after a tractor runs in her truck when it loses control and the brakes seize up. Missing the plane means that she's going to have to stay in town just like everyone else and face the the oncoming onslaught. As night begins to fall, the sheriff runs across a stranger who had earlier been sabotaging the entire town, and with his work seemingly completed, he goes to the diner to get some food. After grabbing a waitress's arm, the sheriff tries to de-escalate the situation, but things begin to seem like they're going to get a little more violent after the sheriff begins to question the man. Having not seen a plane, or a sled, or a boat, or anything come in or fly overhead, the sheriff connects that this stranger may be responsible for what has been going on, seeing as he just randomly appeared with no warning or sightings of his his arrival. The stranger then gets up to attack the sheriff, but then gets a handheld pressed against the back of his skull, as it's the sheriff's estranged wife, Stella, subduing the stranger. As the stranger is then put into a jail cell, he begins to taunt Eben, Stella, and Eben's brother, Jake, as well as the grandmother. He begins to let them know that their end is coming, and that there's really not much they can do to stop it. Believing him to just be insane, they tell him to pretty much shut his mouth, but the stranger would in turn be quite correct. Shortly after putting him in the jail cell, three co-workers are deciding where to go so that they can rage, because their shifts are now over. They walk outside discussing where to open their fifth when the vampires begin to attack the town, starting with the telecommunications center and power supply area. Quickly ending them as the woman runs off to likely meet her end shortly after, they plunge the town into complete darkness and cut it off from the outside world entirely. This would obviously raise some suspicion as to what's happening, so the sheriff loads up with his estranged wife, then heads out to the plant to see what's going on. As he approaches the plant, it is completely dark and there is no movement from anyone. As he begins to inspect the plant, he finds that one of the workers' head has been stuck through onto a pike. Racing back towards the town with Stella, he gets on the loudspeaker and begins telling everyone they need to go back to their houses, lock their doors, and arm themselves with whatever they have. This would do very little ultimately as the warning came too late and the tools were not powerful enough to stop these creatures. At this point, the attack is in full swing. We learn that the alpha vampire's name is Marlo. They appear to speak some language that utilizes their throat more than their tongues, and as a result, it appears quite guttural. As they begin their attack, it is all-out chaos in the streets. With people falling left, right, and center, and others running and gunning, there's no defense 
evidence to any success. Most of the townsfolk fall on the initial attack and then are just left out on the streets. Some of the vampires are ended with crack shots to the head, but anything less of that just makes them angry. It is discovered that the sheriff's grandmother has fallen in the attack after Evan heads back to the station to check on everyone, but prior to this, those that were still left alive after the beginning phases of the attack all meet in the diner to discuss what they should do about their current predicament. While this is happening, Stella and Evan are attacked while their SUV is in flipped, but they are ultimately saved by the snowplow driver from earlier. Going back to the diner, they all decide that they should hide in a local house whose owner left earlier that day. There's an attic space that you would never know was there from the outside, and it seems like that would be their best bet. Meanwhile, in the station, it comes out that the stranger is the reason for all of this. He was tasked with searching out towns after the ship was attacked and allowed to live as a result, but we will find out this isn't a permanent situation for any human. Believing that Marlow would actually turn him into a vampire, he entered Barrow and they tracked his scent. After being placed in the cell of the station, Marlow finds him and thanks him for doing what he was told to do, and then proceeds to snap his neck. So the lesson here is, don't make deals with the monsters. Live human, and meet your end as human, because humanity number one. After this, we learn that nobody will be turned in the town. Instead, it is really just a meat-packing plant. Everyone will be drained, and no new vampires will be joining the band. He orders that after they are done, they will destroy everything to ensure that humanity continues to believe the vampires are just a bad dream made up by primitive man and nothing more. After about a week's time, the vampires begin changing tactics to draw out any remaining survivors. A lone survivor is then sent out into the streets to be used as bait. She walks the streets calling for help as the vampires move along rooftops looking for any movement. Evan wants to go out and help her, but after finding John in the crawl space underneath the building, he becomes entangled with that. The woman was not successful in finding any people, so she is ended after a group toys with her first. As Evan attempts to help John, it becomes clear that he has been infected and is now a vampire. John appears to attempt to hold back even though he is actually fully transformed, and this is really largely unsuccessful, but it does slow him down a little bit. To the fortune of Evan, John gets tangled up in a swing set, which then gives Evan the upper hand as he is able to separate John's head from his shoulders. He learns at this point that the only way to get rid of a vampire is just to straight up behead them. After this event, Wilson and his senile father, who are also hiding up the attic, decide to leave, to which they end up meeting their end out there with the vampires. This only further confirms to the vampires that others are still in hiding and are still very much so alive. In their search for these survivors, they end up finding that John has turned and was ended, designating that one human in particular is continuing to fight. As weather moves in, a blizzard whips up and creates a whiteout condition. Now typically the vampires have increased senses of hearing, smell, and sight. However, with these conditions, all these increased abilities actually turn against them, making them worse off. Utilizing this, the group moves to the general store where a child has been turned and then she attacks the group and wounds one of them. It takes three adults to pin her to the wall where Jake ends her. Unfortunately for the group, the whiteout at this point ends, exposing them and they aren't able to make it back to the attic. Evan decides that everyone should probably make a break for the police station and he will provide a diversion by going off to his grandmother's house to get an ultraviolet lighting system. As he makes his way to the house, he is able to get the generator going, but the vampires are hot on his tail. He gets the UV light ready to rock as Marlo's mate bursts through the door. He uses the UV light on her and she reels backwards and it burns her to disfigurement. Marlo then bends down next to Iris and takes her out with a bite to the neck to put her out of her misery. So as you may guess, this makes Marlo just a tad bit upset and he has now identified who is actually fighting the vampires successfully. As Evan runs out of the house, he is further pursued by these vampires, almost being overtaken. Bo then arrives with a backhoe and begins running through them with the tiller on the front. This causes enough damage to many of the vampires to actually end them in the process. Ultimately though, he would crash into the hotel and as he exits the tractor, he would attempt to end himself via dynamite after lighting a case with a road flare, but ends up surviving the blast. Marlo then gets him and drags him out and digs his shoe into his head, cracking likely the cheekbone, weakening the skull before bringing his foot down on it a second time, completely crushing Bo's skull in the process. This however was successful in giving Evan enough time to make it back to the police station where he meets up with the remaining survivors. After arriving, Carter sort of launches into a monologue and tells the group of how his children and wife are now gone. Being clearly turned, he mentions how they are waiting for him on the other side and how he doesn't want to live forever. It becomes clear in this monologue that his teeth are much sharper than normal as the rest of the group begins to realize that he is actually turned. Requesting to see them in the afterlife with his last shred of humanity, Evan takes him into the back room and separates the old thinking case from the meat suit, hopefully sending him to see that family. Two more weeks pass, and in that time, they manage to find the deputy, Billy Kitka. They signal to him across the street with a flashlight and then go out to meet him. Billy explains that during the initial attacks, they took out his wife and kids as well, and his handheld ended up jamming as he tried to take himself out of the game. Since then, he's been hiding underneath the house. They take him back to the station, where they actually learn that others made it to the power station, which controls the oil pipeline, and appears to be the only structure that has any power. Evan, Stella, and Billy all sneak towards the plant as a new place to stay safe. While doing so, however, they spot a figure 
figure walking down the road covered in blood. A young girl appears to be used as bait and is being stalked by the vampire Zuriel. Seeing as it's a child, Stella runs out and grabs her and brings her back to which Zuriel sees. Evan and Billy attempt to distract the vamp while Stella gets the girl to safety. Ultimately, they are separated but then both make it inside of the plant with Billy being followed by a vampire. As Evan enters, he's happy to see that the other survivors did in fact make it into the plant. However, this is short-lived. The vampire attacks Billy and bites into his neck. This infects and dazes him in the process, making him for easy prey. The vampire then turns to attack Evan, but Billy gets up and knocks the vampire into the shredder, which actually, shredder beats everything. No head separation required. When Billy threw the vampire in though, his arm got caught in the gears and it's a stump. Evan attempts to help, but is pushed off as Billy's screams become less and less human. As the vampire shrieks take over, Evan is forced to take out Billy with an ax. At this point, with sunrise only a few hours away, the vampires decide it's time to take out the town entirely. They slice open the oil pipeline and let the contents begin flooding the town. They then light the oil ablaze to cover their tracks and preserve their secret. However, during this, Stella radios to Evan to tell him that she and the young girl are hiding underneath an abandoned truck across the street and that the flames are heading towards them. If they stay, they will be burned alive. If they run, the vampires will run them down and take them out. Evan realizes that he cannot beat the vampire alpha with normal human strength, so he injects Billy's blood into his radial artery. Watching the blood travel up his artery, he quickly changes as the infection has a direct route in. Overriding the hunger, he approaches Marlo to fight. A direct challenge to the alpha causes the other vamps to back down and watch what happens. Marlo addresses Evan as the one who fights, and then they begin to brawl. After a vicious battle, Evan is then thrown to the side with Marlo, charging him. Utilizing his super strength, Evan then punches through the open mouth of Marlo and straight out the back of his head, ending him in the process. With no time to spare and the group now leaderless, the other vampires disperse quickly. Evan and Stella are seen after watching the sunrise together. As it does, Evan begins to burn. Stella holds him while his skin turns to ash, which looks just, ow, incredibly painful. Eventually the UV light does its work as Evan is turned to ashes mostly and then ended. Okay, so this is a long one, but this movie was pretty lit and had a lot going on. So now that we have an idea of what's happening, we can kind of work out what's going on with these vampires. So there's usually two lines of thoughts with vampires. It's either a disease or it's supernatural. But it can be seen clearly with these creatures in particular that this is much more of a disease profile than that of some crazy unexplainable link. Although with that said, there are some things about these vampires that may point to either something we don't yet understand as a species, or it could be supernatural. The vampires from 30 Days of Night are not your standard vampire. They do possess all the standard traits of vampires such as the added benefits that mean they easily outclass humans. The first is your standard super strength. Upon infection, it does not take long for these creatures to easily overpower others. Even children can take several adults to subdue them, which would mean that the young girl that we see in the store likely had the full strength of a full-grown man. This scales upwards as well, so a full-grown vampire man would be stronger than probably just several human men. The vampires also have an added ability that they can just straight up resist the cold like you wouldn't believe. In Barrow, Alaska during the winter, in the middle of a polar night, it can easily get down to negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 29 degrees Celsius. This would be enough to freeze a human in a matter of hours, like literally freeze them, or at minimum induce hypothermia inside of an hour. The vampires, however, do not seem to notice. Wearing regular clothing, their bodies continue to operate as if they were at room temperature. And we will actually get at why this is a possibility here shortly. But not only do they have the ability to withstand cold, but their body durability is off the charts. Able to take rounds to organs, presumably this would be healed, seeing as they are infected and not so much undead. Another ability is increased sense of sight, smell, and hearing. These creatures are essentially the perfect hunting machines. They can track humans, even tracking the stranger's movement during the day by following his scent in the snow at night for presumably miles until they eventually reach Barrow, Alaska. But now we start getting into the more strange adaptations associated with vamps. Each vampire is inexplicably linked to the alpha. Usually this is seen through the vampiric screeches or the gestures that the alpha will do and this will allow like attacks or basically let other vampires know what's kind of going on. However, it is confirmed in lore that this appears to be almost telepathic and there is a link between the alpha and the group member. This would seem to suggest a few possibilities that does not have to be connected to neural connections, but could more likely be related to pheromones and body language. Pheromones may be more of a natural impulsion that allows the leader with the strongest pheromones to dominate a group of vampires and subject them to his will. However, this would have a limited range, but body language and gesturing seems to be much more in line with what we see in the first movie. Another strange ability seems to be teleportation of the vampires. Able to do short distances, again, I would have to ask, is this really teleportation? Basically, have you ever seen a spider jump before, like one of those really small spiders? It it almost appears as though it moves instantly. It's not really so much teleporting as it's just movement so fast it's outside of human 
perception. Now, are the vampires really teleporting or just moving so quickly it's outside of human perception? I would say you be the judge on that one. And the last and final ability of the vampires is apparent immortality. The creatures we see attacking Barrow have been around since humans apparently huddled around fires talking about what was out in the darkness. This immortality isn't true immortality, however, as the body can most definitely be destroyed and they will meet their end should this happen. So with a quick rundown of abilities, what makes each of these apparently possible? Well, as we know for certain, this is a disease, likely a fast-acting virus more so than a supernatural corruption. A pretty good indicator of this is that someone has to be bit or scratched, and depending on where and when it happened and how much exposure, this person will turn accordingly. So after John's exposure, he apparently stayed under that house for quite a while before turning. Likely he was scratched and a small amount of the virus was transferred. However, when Billy was bit on the neck, this turned him quickly, having a close access to the brain. When Ebbett injected himself, this was also a similar path as like being bit in the neck, and this goes straight for the brain and infecting the body quickly, allowing him to turn quickly as a result. The virus does appear to affect every cell in the body, and would likely induce structural changes within the brain as well, which isn't so surprising due to the impact it has on a cellular level. And this all goes back to neurons! Post-infection, it's clear that these would be heavily impacted. First, concerning muscular strength, the neural firing would likely be stronger and incorporate more muscle strands. As a result, this would lead to an increased strength that we see in these vampires. However, with increased muscle strength, this would also mean that the repair mechanisms would need to be better to repair damaged muscle. After all, you were human. It would be clear that the virus would need to have an ability to affect the metabolic pathways of the body as well as the mitotic abilities and gene repair mechanisms. Going down to a genetic level, likely these genes are inserted from the virus, and this would code for better protein reading mechanisms and repair of the genes of the cell. With this better repair, cancers wouldn't develop due to gene errors, which would be quite necessary for the process of increased mitosis. With damage to the muscle from the strength and likely the speed that seems like teleportation, cellular division would need to be ramped up to 11. With this constant division and cells to keep the body in working order, any mistake in cellular division would likely cause this creature to devolve into a cancerous mass. As a result, starting with a solid foundation allows them to exist and continuing to survive for millennia, because as we see, their bodies don't physically age from the day they're turned, likely not only repairing the genes but also adding telomeres and junk DNA to kind of keep the vampire the same age as it was when it was turned, so this is why they don't degrade or even reverse their aging, sort of like a snapshot of their DNA permanently from that point on. This is backed up by two reasons. The increased metabolism would produce a lot of heat. This may be why these creatures prefer to stalk the northern latitudes as their heat internally produced is balanced out by the frigid cold around them. This is why they can walk around with little to no issue, not even acknowledging the cold, whereas humans would freeze solid. However, the laws of thermodynamics still do exist. We see that the vampires have their skin appear ashen and gray, almost like someone who is frozen or experiencing hypothermia. In humans, this lack of blood flow and eventual cooling of their internal temp would lead to RN. In vamps, however, their internal temperature is more than enough to keep them functional and alive. However, the skin is still very much so exposed to extreme temperatures, and the cells are still dividing to produce heat, but it's pulled away quicker than it is replenished, at least on the surface. This makes them appear gray as blood flow is likely very limited near the top levels of the skin. The mitotic ability hypothesis also works concerning that these creatures are not truly immortal. The body, if damaged enough, can be overwhelmed and they can be ended, meaning that a chemical reaction, much like with us, is what's keeping them alive, not some mystical force. Able to heal from wounds from a handheld, the brain being destroyed, however, or even separated from the body will end them on the spot. And speaking of brain, let's talk about the possible physical structure changes. Now, it's entirely possible, as mentioned before, that the body may be producing pheromones as a means of communication that with the heightened senses of the vamps, they are able to pick up and be influenced by, something humans aren't really persuaded by. However, there is something called mirror neurons. For longtime watchers of this channel, this may sound familiar, but for those who haven't heard of this before, what is something humanity doesn't understand? I mean, really, we have, since the old days, stacked up something that we didn't understand, and we just called it magic. I mean, spontaneous generation wasn't disproven until the mid-19th century, and now it seems laughable to assume that something comes from nothing. We had no idea about bacteria or viruses, we just believed the gods were making us ill or it was bad blood. Well, what about the idea of telepathy, or even that our minds could influence the world around us? Okay, so we're gonna get a little out there, but there were experiments done that did show that placing a person next to an RNG and then told to think about a specific number would cause that number to appear more often than not. Pretty interesting, but the idea is traced back to something called a mirror neuron. Located in the premotor cortex as well as the inferior parietal cortex, and primary somatosensory cortex. These are known to light up after imaging scans are done when apparently trying to communicate via thinking rather than talking, at least in certain individuals. Anyway, the moral of the 
story is we have no clue what the brain is capable of or alterations to what parts could in theory change behavior entirely and communication. Well, this virus in particular, it would seem that it's likely that this would affect the mirror neurons, potentially making them capable of telepathic communication. Also, just so you know, I'll link the RNG experiment in the description. It's pretty interesting read. Uh, it gets a little out there though. It's CIA, so that, you know, you should probably know what you're expecting there. So I know you guys think I forgot, didn't you? Let's discuss for a moment why it is that the vampires turned to ash, as in Eben's case. Seems pretty odd, doesn't it? Well, not if you look at it at a cellular level. One of the things humans need to survive that we get for free all the time, at least during the day, is vitamin D. And this is provided by a chemical reaction after coming into contact with the sun. Find it a little strange that vampires avoid the sun at all costs? Well, as it turns out, vitamin D has antiviral properties just in its existence. Not only does it bolster the immune system, but it seems to naturally cause issue for viruses. So here's what I believe is going on. The bodies of vampires are naturally low or completely depleted of vitamin D, and that's why they stay out of the light, to keep that level low. This allows the virus to flourish within them pretty much unchecked. However, upon coming into contact with the sunlight, vitamin D begins to be being produced because the cells are still cells as they were once fully human. This chemical reaction affects the RNA within the cell transmitted by the virus. Upon this issue arising, the cell undergoes some severe issues. Perhaps the metabolic pathway becomes unchecked due to damages to the virus RNA caused by the vitamin D being produced finally. And as a result, cells begin cooking themselves as the usual control factors coded for by the virus are destroyed. And this runaway process begins to literally burn the cells as each cell produces more and more heat, which ultimately releases steam and then desiccates the cells, turning them into what appears to be ash. So what do I personally think is going on here with the vamps? Well, I believe that these vampires are simply influenced by a virus that preserves DNA at the time of infection, ramps up metabolism leading to super strength, much faster ability to move, which is beyond human perception, and a mind changed and altered that causes them to regard humans as former, but in no way affects their intelligence. As a result, you have excellent hunters that can plan, track, and also hunt way more effectively and ferociously than any human is able to resist. 